く<笑>まずかったですかいや両手であれやでねそれのいらんからって Wait let's go back a little bit I had arrived on the snow barren island of Hokkaido and I was lost I had no idea where to find the Ainu people One night I camped on what I assumed was an empty lot Turns out it was farmland and the property belonged to an elderly couple When I finally woke up they saw me and invited me into their self-built home made entirely out of wood They offered me food, warmth, and information about the Ainus in Hokkaido So from what they told me there are three primary places where the ethnic Ainus reside Shirawi Nibutani and Akanko. The Ainu movement in Shirawi is mostly run by the government, so that's out of the equation. Akanko caught my interest first. There's a national park, it's very remote, it's a road less travel with extreme weather condition this time of year. Perfect. But unfortunately, time is limited for me. There's no guarantee that I can make it back to Tokyo for my flight. Darn. That only leaves me with Nibutani, so that's where I headed. After a couple more days of hitchhiking, I've arrived in Nibutani, the most densely Ainu populated town in Hokkaido. The first person I encountered was Kenji Sekine. He's been studying the Ainu language and culture intently for the past 20 years. A lot of kids and grown ups are attending his Ainu language class, like this little boy here. Kenji is also one of the chaperones at the Nibutani Ainu Culture Museum, located in the center of town. The museum features a handful collection of artifacts and visual demonstrations to recreate the image of the primitive lifestyles of the Ainus. Adjacent to the museum is the souvenir shop. That's where Maki Sekine works at. She is part Ainu and is married to Kenji. Here you can find a ton of Ainu crafts that Maki herself and the other villagers have contributed. Like this Ainu traditional robe called Atus. It's made by Maki's mother, Yukiko. And the process is very time consuming. The evolution begins with this log of wood. First, they cut it up, soak it in water, cut up some more, dry it, and shave it into paper thin scraps. <laughs> Oh, and this is Masaki. He's an anthropology major from Tokyo. Currently, he's conducting a research study about the Ainus, and to do so, he's been residing here and volunteering at the museum. My new acquaintances have been very hospitable. They welcomed me into their house with open arms and showed me the lifestyle of the modern day Ainus. Until a tragedy happened. <laughs> I was just kidding. But still, I would like to experience a little bit more. So then I move on to another house. And that's how I met Miss Ashirire. The Ainu woman has spent most of her life here on the outskirts of town. She makes up a big part of the Ainu activist community, holding many seminars and traditional ceremonies all throughout Japan. Miss Leda makes Ainu handicrafts as well, but what she's more locally known for is her shamanic abilities. She could potentially communicate with kamui, spirits that are associated with classified living things. Plants, animals, rocks, everything has kamui in the Ainu culture. I truly admire the self-sufficient lifestyle that she's been maintaining. Uh, it's refreshing to meet someone who does not rely too much on modern day technology and limiting themselves from consumerism, even more so in a country like Japan. Nibutani does not have any markets that sells food, and the closest one is about 5 kilometers away. Therefore, they cultivate rice, potatoes, and some regional vegetables to be consumed daily. They also harvest sansai, vegetables that are found in the wild. This one in particular is called Fukinoto, and it can be found all over northern Japan. The taste and the texture is pretty similar to lettuce, but it has a hint of sweetness, and the aftertaste is a bit on the bitter side. First, it needs to be soaked and rinsed with water, and then one of the ways to prepare this is Fukimiso. You chop it up finely and stir fry it with miso until it becomes a sweet, savory paste. and it goes so well with fresh steamed rice. The next sansai is a bit further out of reach. We had to hike for an hour into the woods, but that's not the problem. 
The problem is that it's only grown at an obscure 45 degree angle. This, my friend, is Skyoja Ningniku, something that you've been missing out on your whole life. We spent nearly the entire day in the mountains, and this is how much we collected. Well, Kaori here have done most of the work. I was struggling to film and try not to fall at the same time. And just like the other one, we have to rinse them thoroughly with water first. Then, we parboil it to further sanitize it, as well as releasing its intricate garlicky flavor. And that's it! Condiments are not necessary to enjoy this delicacy. The last thing I want to introduce is the Ainu camp. They are direct descendants from the extinct native wolves that used to roam around Japan. The Ainus were the first ones to domesticate the wolves and made the beasts accompany them in rounding up bears, deer, boars, and other wild animals. The Ainuken is extremely loyal, self-sustainable, and have leadership qualities that distinguishes them from all the other dog breeds in the world. However, their numbers are very few and it is very unlikely that you ever come across one of these guys outside of this region. Well, that's all I've got for you in this video. I hope you've learned a few things through my Ainu encounter. If you ever get the chance, I highly recommend visiting this remote village. You will have a better sense of what this fascinating culture has to offer. Please subscribe and stay tuned for my upcoming videos. Uh, until next time, adventure out.